J.D. Hayworth back now on America's Forum and back with a guest we've had before. And no, I'm not bringing him back just because his initials are J.D. He is Jack Devine, and he knows of a very difficult topic because he was involved in our intelligence community. His book is entitled Good Hunting, an American Spy Master's Story. Jack Devine, a 32-year veteran of the CIA, it's so good to have you on this morning from Newsmax, New York. Jack, thanks so much for your time. Great to be here. Now, Jack, the, the challenge of uh, offering insights on intelligence, the intelligence community, and, and the CIA, in the final analysis, what prompted you to write your memoir? Well, you know, I've seen an awful lot of books written in the past decade about people that were not practitioners who were highly critical of the use of CIA in the realm of covert action. And I thought it was about time to write something that explained not only defending it, but I'm an advocate of covert action. That's using below the radar resources, political action, psychological warfare, economic, and in occasions, paramilitary things. Well, given the fact that covert actions, by their strict definition, are not to be talked about, how tough was it for you to, to open the archives and uh, shed some light on the covert actions in which you had some involvement or America certainly was involved in? One of the things I learned uh, late in uh, my career is that almost all covert action becomes public. So when you start it um, as, a, uh, as a CIA officer, you need to realize that at some point in your life, you're likely to read about it. And that's exactly what happened in my case. I was in Chile when Allende was overthrown. They declassified all the documents. I was in the middle of the Iran-Contra affair, reluctantly, if you will. I ran the Afghan program against the Russians. All these things became public. I, you know, I knew Rick Ames, the mole inside of CIA. What isn't in the book are the agents that I meet, met late at night or recruited, uh, with one or two exceptions where they became public as well. This is the action part. And while it's covert, you, you do realize at some point in time uh, it's very hard to keep a war, say the Afghan war, where you're supplying 125,000 fighters secret forever. Uh, and I think that's true today in many of the things that are going on. And uh, I sense that we're still very active, thank goodness. Well, in, in terms of covert action, you mentioned, for example, the overthrow of Allende. Uh, a lot of people look back on that through the lens of history and they say that, that that wasn't a good thing that happened. Give us the case for the overthrow of the Marxist Allende in Chile in the 1970s. Uh, J.D., this is, uh, I'm going to try and keep this tight because this is a really uh, complicated yeah, issue. Yeah, I don't mean there to get us down two, in the weeds. Two coup, yeah, go ahead, sir. Two coup attempts, one in 1970, which was uh, uh, something that the White House wanted conducted. The people in the field said it wasn't going to happen. It failed. Um, and in 1973, I mean, they was overthrown. I was there. I received the first message from an agent that it was going to happen. We were not working with the military. So people confuse the two events. It is, uh, and it's become part of the public view that the CIA worked with the military to overthrow Allende, and that's just not accurate, and the files uh, demonstrate that. Oh, what is in the files also is that we did engage in political action, working with the parties, protecting the newspapers, working with the unions, and so on. So uh, when you look at CIA, one of the things that's most un misunderstood about it is that CIA is an action arm. It does what the executive asks it to do. So when you don't like things, whether it's the Shah of Iran or Mossadegh in Guatemala, or I mean, in Arbenz in Guatemala or Allende, you have to look at it as a policy issue. And that's the right place because the president's elected, he has to stand before the American people. CIA is the instrument that is used for that policy. Fair enough. CIA implements the policy using its intelligence assets. Understand. Uh, you also talk about a warning uh, that you gave to George Tenet that there was, quote, a bullet coming from Iraq with his name on it. Can you tell us what you meant by that and uh, perhaps give us your thoughts on the current situation in Iraq? What I was concerned about uh, was, first of all, 
you know, after 9-11, I was very much interested in seeing us bring down the Taliban and get bin Laden. I was concerned that the, what I would call, misdirection towards Iraq uh, would take energy away from it. But my big concern is that when, and it's uh, sort of the Colin Powell doctrine, when you go into a, Iraq and you, you take it, you own it, and nation building, uh, I want to be really clear in the book I go through this, I'm not a nation builder, you know. I'm for being under the radar, carrying out actions. But when you get into nation building, I know a lot about Afghanistan and a lot about Iraq. It is very hard, and we see the, the, the fruits of this today. It is so hard to establish a government we can be comfortable with, let alone democratic, when the indigenous people aren't ready and prepared to fight for it. And I think that's, you know, we're, when we try to force that on people, we run, we run into a disaster. And our, our heart's in the right place, but we have to be more tough-minded about it. We just can't will these things to happen. So, Jack, from your perspective, uh, rather than nation-building, nation we should be in the business of threat neutralizing, taking away threats to the United States. Is that the way to read it? Well stated. Well, very well stated, J.D. I mean, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, you, you collect intelligence to protect yourself, and you work with uh, foreign governments and foreign intelligence services and with indigenous people, and you support them to the degree you can under the radar in the context of their willingness and ability to act. And that applies in uh, Syria, Kurdistan, Afghanistan, uh, and unfortunately the growing arc of insecurity that we're looking at around the world. A little more than a minute remains. We're hearing talk now, our president blaming the current situation in Iraq on bad intelligence estimates. Do, do you share the president's assessment there? I don't have firsthand experience. My really strong sense is that we had plenty of intelligence on just how ominous ISIS was. What I think was missed, and it's really hard to get a handle on this, is when did they decide to move uh, and, and, and in terms of a military force. And I think what surprised everybody, and it's a tragedy, is just how unprepared the Iraqi military was to stand and hold ground. And that was a, a, you know, a, a failure to assess that, but I, having been there, you almost don't see it until it's too late. I think we have enough time, a quick response. The other controversy in the news, the CIA basically hacking in to the Senate Intelligence Committee's computers. Talk about covert action and a violation of the charter right here in Capitol Hill. Your take on that controversy? I have no explanation. It absolutely is a stunner. Uh, I'm hoping that as this thing plays out, it makes more sense. Uh, it makes no sense to me politically, legally, or... Uh, in terms of uh, maintaining a good relationship with Congress, which is critical. So I, I don't understand it. Hopefully the facts will ameliorate my, my amazement. Jack Devine will have to leave it there. Thank you for your insights. Again, the book written by Jack, Good Hunting, an American Spy Master's Story. Changing gears now. Seeing lights flashing in your rear view mirror as you're getting pulled over. Well, that could be stressful. Just talking to police may be nerve wracking for you. It is important that you know your rights. And that is the focus of this morning's You and the Law segment, hosted by famed defense attorney, Alan Dershowitz here on Newsmax TV. Even if you've never committed a crime or were in any way involved in criminal conduct, at some point in your life, law enforcement agents may ask to interview you about some case or some person. So here's the scenario. A police detective or even an FBI agent comes to your home and business unannounced. That's the way they usually do it. They inform you that they have a few questions about something directly or indirectly relating to somebody or something involving a criminal matter. They promise it's not going to take much time and you want to seem as cooperative as possible. You certainly don't want them to think you're hiding something. So the inclination is to sit down with them and answer their questions. Should you do that before consulting with an attorney? Well, this one is really easy to answer. No. 
under no circumstances should you ever talk to a detective or FBI agent who wants to discuss your possible involvement or that of other persons who you know in a crime without first consulting with an attorney. You should very politely explain to the officer that you're inexperienced in this kind of situation, that you know you have a right to a lawyer, even if you did nothing wrong. You can tell them you're going to be glad to speak with them, but first you need to consult with your attorney. When you do agree to be interviewed, your lawyer should be present for the entirety of the interview. You know, many people, including wealthy and famous people, have found themselves going to prison for something they said to an investigator. Martha Stewart, for example, was convicted and served time, not for what she was suspected to have done, but for lying to a federal law enforcement.